I'm Luke's story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. Welcome to a very special bonus rebroadcast episode of my recent appearance on the Smarter Tech Podcast. In this episode, our host Nick picks my brain about everything I've learned about jet lag and travel over the past 20 years. We cover all of the technologies, supplements, and practices to make travel suck less. Enjoy the show. Hey, this is Nick Pino, a.k.a. the EMF Guy, and you're listening to the Smarter Tech Podcast. Today, I'm talking with my buddy Luke Story from the Lifestylist Podcast, actually one of the podcasts that I appreciate the most uh, in the world, along maybe with Paul Cech's uh, Living with 4D. So it, it, it goes back and forth. But uh, Luke has been uh, a tremendous resource for me in the many hundreds of different scientists and researchers and uh, health experts that he has interviewed throughout the years on his podcast. And now I get to pick his brain on jet lag. Luke, uh, loves to travel, but he also tends to get massively disrupted and get all sort of side effects from jet lag. So he's, he, he's basically become his own expert at hacking jet lag. And today, this is really what we're going to address is what kind of technologies, including uh, tools, including blue light blocking glasses, including EMF blocking clothing, including uh, supplements, what tools does Luke Story use? to keep himself ready to go when he travels internationally uh, and he will probably resume his world travels as soon as the COVID thing is past us. And uh, we explored that. So just reading his official bio here, uh, Luke Story is a mot- motivational speaker, Kundalini yoga and meditation teacher, world-class biohacker and host of the Lifestylist podcast and founder of the world's first and online and and only online fashion school for stylists, uh, School of Style, which he founded in 2008. So without further ado, let's dive into my conversation on hacking jet lag with my buddy, Luke Story. Luke Story, thanks so much for being here. Hey, man. Good to see you again. I feel like we just had our epic conversation on my podcast five minutes ago. It actually came out today, which is funny. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's a few weeks back. I don't even seriously with with COVID. It's like every, every day is the same here. I've been working seven on seven. Basically, me and my wife, Jen, are here at my father's place and I, I work half day. So I'm not I mean, I'm not over overworked by any means, but I'm still I'm working on a part two of that COVID article now because I'm just obsessed with the numbers and, and putting things into perspective. But today I wanted to interview you because, uh, well, one day, <laughs> let's, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but one day air travel and tra- travel is going to resume worldwide. And it's, uh, actually they're, th- they're thinking about it. Uh, so I want to talk about air travel, jet lag. And basically I, I know you're, I mean, you're a biohacking geek. You have tried a lot of different biohacking tools, a lot of supplements, a lot of lifestyle lifestyle modifications or breeding techniques. I want from all of your arsenal, I want to learn more for me and for my listeners, what technologies, because this is a smarter tech podcast, my new my new podcast, what technologies have helped you the most fight that dreaded jet lag? Because you mentioned something. A lot of I listen to your podcast a lot, and you mentioned that jet lag is the worst for you, has always been. So maybe talk about that and how you basically what are the, the, the basic steps of your of your entire journey uh, learning how to fight jet lag. Oh, how fun! I'm glad that I didn't prepare. <laughs> <laughs> Although, as you're asking the question, I'm thinking, uh, oh shit, Luke, you didn't prepare. You're going to remember all the good stuff that you put together, but I'm sure it'll come to me. Uh, yeah, you know, this is actually a a passion of mine is figuring out how to travel uh, with doing the least amount of damage and to minimize 
the negative effects on travel. And I, and I include travel and also ground travel, ground transportation, because I yeah. get almost as smoked from long road trips in a car as I do from flying. So uh, my mm -hmm. objective is to always minimize the damage and bounce back as quickly as possible, whether I'm going somewhere for work or for pleasure uh, or when I come home so that I don't have to spend so much time recovering. And I don't know why, especially with air travel, I seem to be wrecked by it more than anyone I know. I mean, I've traveled with people that I've dated over the years or business partners and friends and we're flying on the same plane at the same time and we land wherever our destination is and they're ready to go hang out and have fun. And I'm like, dude, I got to go sleep for three hours. I'm just... <laughs> <Yeah>. Or three days. <laughs> three days in some cases. So, um, you know, the, the inspiration to really dive into this particular topic and refine my practices and protocols has just come out of my own interest in... Uh, making it survivable myself. And um, I still haven't quite figured out why I'm m more susceptible to it than most people. I guess it doesn't really matter. Uh, I just apply every possible solution so that I suffer as little as possible yeah. when I leave the house and go somewhere else, you know, because I, like I always like to say, I, um, I love to go to different places, but I hate to travel. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I do. I love to explore the world. And, uh, you know, I'm so curious about life in general and how different cultures live. And I love visiting the plants and animals and people and different climates and uh, all the different topography around the world. But there is always this price to pay. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm quite interested in learning more and also sharing what I've put together uh, to the point that at one point I even recorded uh, a series of videos on my top uh, travel hacks. And I was just going to put them out as kind of free mini bits of content. It ended up being like a three hour documentary, essentially. <laughs> so I was going to make it an online class. And then I could just never get around to doing it, or actually finishing and executing it, uh, largely due to the fact that I travel so much. <laughs> so it's like, I had all this this content in the can and now it's sort of outdated. So I just shelved the project and I'm, I'll do some other type of paid content. But it, it was so resourceful and valuable uh, that I never, you know, I, well, that I, I thought it's too much to give away for free because it's a lifetime yeah. worth of research. But uh, I'm really happy that you asked because I can give you as much as I can now. Yeah, so, let's give a fraction of that. Yeah. <laughs> just because I don't have three hours. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, I'm trying to think where to take this. Like, do you want to go in? Uh, I was I was thinking just before the podcast. Why don't we take this chronologically? Uh, chronologically, trying to uh, chronologically. You know, uh, that that word. Yeah. So, in order of operation, um, I I do certain things on like the morning of, or do you start with melatonin a few days prior? Maybe talk about the before uh, at the airport in the plane, and then the after. Great. Maybe. That's yeah. the course was going to be laid out. Um, okay. <laughs> a good place to start with might be the why. So mm. let's start with, and then we'll get into the how. And I like doing it in chronological order because, of course, that is the most applicable and makes the most sense for the people listening. But let's just think about how the human organism is designed, right? We're designed to ne just first fundamentally to never uh, travel faster than our feet or an animal uh, that we happen to ride, such as a horse, uh, can take us, right? And so I think about, um, you know, ground travel and, uh, and I'm so curious as to why that's disruptive. And one of the theories that I've come up with, and I don't know this to be true, but it seems to make sense just on a fundamental level, is that there are all these geopathic stress zones across mm -hmm. the planet, right? Where you're an EMF guy, you're aware of that. I'm sure your audience will be. But uh, my, you know, rudimentary understanding of geopathic stress, um, uh, you know, lines are where there's a crack in the Earth's surface, and there's a negative magnetic field that's being created where these plates are cracked and and intersect. And um, there also happen to be where there are water veins that create a magnetic field running, you know, underneath the surface of the earth. So as we traverse across the earth, uh, normally we would just pass through those. And I think historically throughout some cultures, there has been some awareness of these ley lines. Obviously, if you look at the way things are laid out in ancient Egypt and places like that on earth where these mono yeah. 
were created. And, you know, people are very aware of not only the cosmos and, you know, the, 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 uh, the galaxy as a whole, but also what pertains to what happens on the ground and what's underneath the ground even. So this is, you know, part of the human knowledge base. And we've known that it's best not to settle on those geopathic stress zones. Um, I have one under my house right now that comes right under the bed, of course, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, which I'm dealing with in a number of ways. But one of my theories on travel and why it smokes you so much, or people like me that are quite sensitive, especially to electromagnetic fields, is that you're crossing all of these ley lines you know, hundreds of them per minute or thousands of them per hour, depending on how fast you're going, right? And just naturally, you would never be subjected to that much gradient in a magnetic field. You wouldn't be going through the ups and downs and the chaotic, the energy um, field uh, of that. So I think that has a lot Mm -hmm. to do with it. And then also in a car, I've measured the EMF in my car. I'm I'm sure you've experimented with this a bit. Um, I've got a, I think it's a 2018 BMW X5 and and I went in and I got I got a good deal on a lease and it was the manager's car so it has all the bells and whistles it's like what they call yeah. loaded right and I was like oh this is awesome I have all this <laughs> you know all these motion sensors and you know rear camera and all of this yeah. and then as I did a little research I found out that uh, you know cars like that that have the motion sensors have radar all the way around them so I don't know what. Yep. It's 30 gigahertz or 60 gigahertz, but essentially you've got radar dishes inside like your bumpers. Yeah, it's it's in the uh, 76 to 77 gigahertz, I think. <laughs> Most radar. Yeah, one engineer, uh, Pavel Wipischowski, is featured on on the the first uh, uh, episode five, six, and seven of my of my podcast and uh he, he's ta- he, he's the only one basically who emailed me and said nick well yeah you know some people are, are afraid of the higher frequencies of 5g everywhere but uh who has considered that since something like 2016 basically every new car that's high end enough to have like positioning uh or sensors especially in europe most of them have them from what i could gather uh these are radar so the millimeter waves are essentially everywhere in the street and the plume that they're creating like no one is measuring those and the the equipment that you would need to measure those is like fifty thousand dollars and upwards so most uh unless you're a, tel- a telco engineer you wouldn't be able to even tell so that's just another source that is mostly ignored or, or misunderstood of like, well, radiation that we are just left to wonder what it's doing to us. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for, for your input on sure. that. Uh, I was just recently made aware of that. And now I'm like, I want to drive a 1976 Ford <laughs> or something, you know? Yeah. So, so you've got the you've got the millimeter waves. You've got the radar in the car. You're crossing geopathic stress zones constantly for hours and hours. And this would be true, obviously, of air travel exponentially. And who knows what's even going on in terms of, you know, the solar radiation and yep. what's happening in the atmosphere um, at the altitude at which you fly. Uh, another thing is the magnetic field. I tested the magnetic field on my car, and it's I mean, it's almost just blows the meter up. It's so powerful down by your legs. And even up toward the the chest a little bit. And then you've got some cars, you know, of course, have a tracking device in them, which is more EMF. And then you've got the Wi-Fi hotspot in the car. Mine's, of course, turned off, but still just the connectivity of Bluetooth and all that stuff. So, yep. so with, with ground travel, I've been able to put that together as a sort of, well, of course, I'm getting a lot of oxidative stress from just all of that, right? Uh, then with the air travel, you know, it's interesting. I've tested EMFs on planes and the planes that have Wi-Fi, obviously, you're going to have a pretty high RF field to keep all of those people connected. But I've tested electric fields and magnetic fields on a few flights, and they're they're negligible. I mean, it's, there's barely anything there. Oh, okay. Which is interesting because I always just figured I'm like I always wear my you know EMF proof clothing and my lambs cap and my underwear and you know I go I'm like psycho. I bring my blue shield and my Soma Vedic plugged in around me. I've got scalar waves and all this stuff uh, on the plane, and then I realize, wow, if I'm if there's no Wi-Fi, I'm actually doing okay, it seems in most cases. Um, But the one thing I did realize on a plane is if you're in a seat, and I've not tested this, but I'd be curious to see if you have, or I'm sure we will now, is imagine when you're sitting in a seat and and there's a TV screen in front of you on the seat in front of you, and then Mm -hmm. behind your head, there's a monitor. And you're like leaning back for 6, 10, 12 hours on that TV on the back of your head. I imagine there's probably a pretty gnarly, gnarly electric field behind your head. 
There actually, I've heard that, uh, in certain flights, I haven't tested it, but some engineers did. And uh, on certain flights, every single screen is a miniature router as a, as a wireless emitter and receiver in it. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> so your head, your headrest has a, I, I don't know what the levels are, but I mean, who cares, right? You're, you're cooking inside a metal tube at 30,000 feet. And it is just either that or you have strong Wi-Fi routers throughout like every couple of feet. So it depends, but it's just, it's going in this direction. Uh, it's going to get worse in, in, in planes, right? So yeah, it's, if, it, if, it, if it's not that, it's going to be something else eventually, like more Bluetooth sensors for whatever applications they want. So. Yeah, it's it's not getting better. So as far as the why, there's the air, there's the ground travel and the air travel. Then additionally, with the air travel, obviously, obviously you have the confusion of your circadian rhythm, but mm. not just your hormones and your neurotransmitters from changing time zones in such an unnatural fashion, but also your gut biome and all of the microbes inside you that really make up who you are and uh, and also produce many of your neurotransmitters, et cetera, they're also terribly confused by switching time zones and traveling around the planet in a way that is just, they've not been designed from an evolutionary standpoint to do. Yeah. So that's kind of the problem as I see it. Why some people like me are more susceptible than others, I don't know. I mean, I don't know who could live a healthier life than me. I mean, I ate a little sugar here and there, but other than that, it's like, I'm a, I got a very clean house, clean. Yeah. It's like, You're like a monk. Yeah, I really am. <laughs> oh, uh, although today I did smoke a nice Cuban cigar for breakfast, uh, which was amazing. So I have my vices, but, um, yeah. You know, generally speaking, I, like, why am I so susceptible? Maybe it's because I'm so in tune that I'm more sensitive. I don't know. Um, but anyway, that's the why. So let me, let me give you some hacks. Okay. The things that I've found that really, um, that really move the needle. And so we have to look at, okay, what are the, the net effects of all those things? And I would say inflammation and oxidative stress would be mm -hmm. kind of, you know, the root cause of whatever symptoms one might associate with travel, which could be manifesting as, you know, fatigue or even nausea or headaches. Or for me, if it has to do with, you know, a time zone thing, often it's just like this, this profound level of brain fog and just kind of confusion and being disoriented. Uh, the other thing I find interesting about this, and I've act, asked Jack Cruz and a couple of people that I've interviewed um, about this, and he's the only one that had really a sensible answer, but typically people get worse jet lag uh, in terms of the circadian mismatch from traveling west to east. Ironically, when I travel west to east, and it doesn't really matter how far I could travel from LA to New York or to London, and it's basically the same, I'm, I'm actually okay. But when I fly east to west and I come back to LA, I'm devastated every time. And mm. Jack's, Jack's analysis of this was that there is so much EMF in the environment in the city of LA that when you're, when you drop in altitude in a plane and you pass through, all of those fields that you just get completely fried. I mean, that was his analysis. I don't know if that's, you know, the whole story, but it is interesting because it's supposed to work the other way because you're like, you're losing time when you're traveling uh, to a later time zone effectively. Yeah. You're like fast forwarding yourself into a future that doesn't exist yet. Whereas traveling backwards, in a sense, you're gaining that time back because it's earlier where you're going. So yeah. theoretically, you should get more fatigued traveling east than you do west. For me, it's opposite. So that's another piece of it, which maybe a smart listener of yours will solve for me because it's so baffling. Uh, but anyway, let's start out with, with that just as the premise. Okay, here's the why, here's the problem. So my number one thing, and again, this is just coming from a lot of intuition and things I pick up here and there, is the inflammation piece, the oxidative stress. So I'm going to look at whatever's going to reduce that. So I would say um, before I fly, I will be very careful to stay as keto as I can, uh, do as much intermittent fasting as I can, and avoid any inflammatory foods. Because I eat, you know, I eat some grains here and there. I'm not perfect. I have little gluten relapses every once in a while, and it, it wrecks me. And then I learn my lesson for a couple months, and then I test it again. The same thing happens, etc. Uh, yeah. But I will be mindful of that. So just in terms of what I'm eating, uh, another thing that I'll do if I have the discipline before traveling, and this is more about the neurotransmitters and the hormones and yoking myself to the circadian rhythm of where I am before I travel mm. is doing sunset 
and sunrise uh, sun gazing. Yeah. Uh, all grounded, electrically grounded, barefoot or touching a grounding thing, you know, touching a rock, tree, grass, wherever I happen to be. Uh, even sometimes in my car, I have a grounding rod that hangs from the bottom of my car. It's like an anti-static strap, it's called. Yeah. Uh, which doesn't work if you're on asphalt, but if you're on any other surface, typically it grounds your car, or at least and then you ground to the grounding system of your car. And so doing that sunrise, sunset uh, is a great way to at least indicate to my body in a really firm way where we are on the planet. And then, of course, to do the same thing immediately mm-hmm. wherever I happen to land. Um, so, for example, my last trip, I think my last long trip was to London for the Health Optimization Summit. And where I was situated in my hotel, there was nowhere to see the sunrise. So in terms of technology, uh, often if I'm unable to interface with nature and use nature to bring myself back into balance, I'll bring technologies that mimic nature. So I brought this full spectrum uh, blue light actually uh, called a Verilux. It's about yay big, you know, it's about six, eight inches tall. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it's obviously pales in comparison in terms of the lumen, luminous power of the sun. I yeah. mean, you know, it doesn't even, it's like a drop in the ocean of what the sun does in terms of the brightness, but it does have the full spectrum colors of the rainbow and mimics midday sun. Then I also have the little mini juve red light device, and I'll put both of those on and make myself get up when it's the time of the sunrise, no matter what time I landed. And I'll just put those on a desk and shine both of those at the same time. So I'm getting that the the UVA, UVB, and also the red light and the different spectrums of red light as much as I can. I forget the the nanometers of the Jew. You're telling your body, look, this is morning now, right? Like, yeah, in a powerful way. Even if I fall back to sleep because I'm exhausted, I still... okay. Yeah. Sometimes I do because I, you know, I might have went to bed at midnight or 2 a.m. and then I'm getting mm. 6 a.m. to mimic the sunrise. But if I can do that, I find that it exponentially speeds up the recovery in terms of the time zone change, not inflammation, not any of the other things that we'll talk about, but definitely it does trick your mind rather quickly into the new time zone. The best option would be, of course, whenever you land to get out and watch the sunset and the sunrise while grounded in a real way. But if you can't access that, if I'm in a hotel that doesn't have roof access and there's tall buildings around and things like that, um, that's what I'll do. So prior to flying, it's that. Uh, I also went so far as to recently purchase my own hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Wow. Uh, In the back cottage right up there. I just got out of it actually about an hour ago. Uh, Because I just use it for cognitive function and all sorts of other things. But uh, I'll definitely, like, if I am able to find time around 90 minutes before I go get on a plane, I'll do a hyperbaric session. Mm. And that's going to not only saturate your red blood cells, which you can also do from breath work or breathing little oxygen canisters. It's not that hard to get your, you know, your red blood cell uh, oxygen levels up. And you can test them with the pulse oximeter. But what the hyperbaric does is it, it um, saturates your blood plasma with oxygen because of the pressure. And that's really what makes hyperbaric chambers work. And that's how you get so hyper oxygenated. However, from my understanding, uh, there is uh, one detrimental effect of it is that it's, it, it is oxidative. So I'll get the benefits of that. And then when I get out as an antioxidant, I'll use my hydrogen gas inhaler do some red light therapy. This is kind of my thing I do every day, actually. And then I'll, uh, after the hyperbaric, then the hydrogen, then I'll do the juve. Then I'll go into the um, ice bath to shunt all the inflammation that was just created from the hyperbaric. And so that leaves me feeling very clear, not inflamed at all, and ready to fly. Now, that's kind of just like lifestyle stuff in terms of supplementation. Uh, I go back and forth on the fish oil thing. You know, there's a lot of people that are very yeah, right. poofa. And so that I get caught up in that. I'm like, oh shit, too many omega threes. <laughs> That's not good. Uh, and so what I do with the fish oil, there's enough brain experts like Dr. Daniel Amen, who I interviewed. He did, he did one of his spec scans on me and he's like, you need hyperbaric and fish oil. And I'm like, okay, this guy's treated thousands of people yeah. with oil and it's improved their brain. So I don't know, is there the negative effects of all those PUFAs? Maybe. Do the benefits outweigh them? I think so. Uh, When it comes to flying, I like the fish oil 
because it fundamentally just in a simple way thins your blood and increases blood flow. And so um, that's kind of part of my protocol. Now, what I do to offset some of the PUFA damage is I take a shit ton of uh, vitamin E with it also. It's okay. Antithesis of the PUFA. Hey, can you mention some... Uh, you're okay to mention brand. So fish oil, because again, you can have horrible quality fish oil, right? I mean, not against Costco. Costco is actually pretty decent, but let's say Walmart. You just grab random fish oil. It's probably not what you're referring to. You know, I've um, I've I've gone through a lot of different brands. Uh, yeah, myself. The one that I do, I well, I do cod liver oil. It's uh, called okay. Rosita. Rosita. R- oh, okay, yeah, the extra virgin. Okay, uh, Rosita. Yeah, one. God, I just put it on my site. I believe I learned about it from Ben Greenfield. Um. Oh man, I forget the name of it, but I, the blue ice. Um, no, here, no? I can so, tell you. Here, give me <laughs> one second. <laughs> no worries. No, no, that's all right. That's all right. So, Rosita, there, there's a few brands. Cod liver oil. I'm actually, uh, I'll, I'll start uh, looking into it for my for my uh, two year old, especially next year. I think at three they can start kind of like the the Western A price approach, if you will. So, I think it's going to be the blue ice brand. That's like the. Yeah. One of the, the main brands recommended, but Rosita is another one that popped out, I think, a few years back that is extra virgin. It's a different process. It's not fermented. And what's this, this other one, the other one? Uh, yeah, the other one, um, let me see here. I can tell you right now because I just added it to my site. I'll shamelessly plug lukestray.com forward slash store. So anything that I talk about that I do, part of my model is I just I put everything that I like yeah. in the store. Um, let me see. Oh, that's weird. I don't seem to have that uh, fish oil. Anyway, I can. Well, well yeah, send, send it. Send it to me. I'll, it'll, it'll be in the show notes. And but I'll send it to you. But anyway, back to the supplementation. So I want. Um, I like the blood thinning effect of the fish oil. So I'll, I'll also take that like periodically during the flight. Um, but I'm going to load up on that a bit beforehand. And then in addition to the inhalation of molecular hydrogen gas, I have a device made by a company called Vital Reaction. Okay. That make their it's a medical device. They they're quite popular in Japanese hospitals incidentally, especially post surgery as they're such an, a powerful anti-inflammatory. Yeah. I also do the hydrogen water. Vital Reaction makes an effervescent magnesium tablet like many companies make. They all basically are the same. Uh, so I'll load up on that big time. Uh, also uh, wa- some of these are like while flying and before flying. Uh, definitely while flying, I'm going to fast again to be in ketosis or as close as I can to it. I'll even bring some exogenous ketones with me. I'll load up on that. I'll definitely not eat sugar or carbs and basically not eat for as long as I fly. And if I get the math right, what I'll do my best to do, I'm not perfect at this because the math gets a little challenging depending on what time zone changes you're making. Mm -hmm. But the idea there is to eat a big meal whenever your big meal in your destination would be. Yeah. So just you have to kind of plan ahead and think, okay, I'm landing in X country and it's going to be uh, you know, uh, 8 p.m. there. What's the equivalent where I'd eat a big dinner? What's the equivalent of that where I am now and eat that? And sometimes that might be actually on the plane, you know, which I'll eat like Yeah beef jerky and just kind of you know high protein high fat stuff like that fats yeah Be- because of the effect uh if i'm not mistaken there's a strong circadian effect of meal timing too right yeah well it has you know it has to do with your gut biome too so you want to get okay. yeah get the signaling to your gut biome as close as you can to what's normal and natural because you also have to trick your gut biome because they're part of your biology obviously yeah time zone, just like you're tricking the rest of your body and your brain into that time zone as well. And uh, one of the negative effects I've noticed from traveling is just, I really get uh, dysbiosis and will have digestive problems. Even if I'm eating super clean, just from traveling, the bugs in your gut are like, wait, what? Why are you eating right now? Why are you eating right now? What is happening here? You know, yeah. so the the eating windows and the fasting and all of that is kind of part of it too. Um, some other supplements that I like before and after travel are uh, astaxanthin. Astaxanthin is a red seaweed. It's an algae oil. It's not something I take all the time, but uh, it's said to make you more resilient to oxidative stress and solar radiation. I know that it works for sure for just being resilient for actual sun exposure, 
a chaga tea, like a really thick chaga tea, just boiling chaga chunks uh, also has that effect. It's sort of like an internal sunscreen. And so mm-hmm. I load up on the astaxanthin, on the chaga. Then also uh, sometimes I'll take uh, liquid chlorophyll, which is really high in copper. Uh, also, I bring uh, Oceans Alive marine phytoplankton, which is really... Oh, yeah. I've really, had it for a couple of years. It's really high in SOD, super oxide dismutate. Yep. These are you know, just anything I can think of that's anti-inflammatory, that's anti-oxidative stress. And you know, sometimes I use some of those supplements, sometimes not. Uh, one thing I definitely do on the plane as well that's really useful for inflammation is I'll put... Uh, four tablets of that vital reaction hydrogen in a water. And I take one of the, which is a lot. It's like, I think it's like, it would be 10 parts per million from just one of those and a, you know, one cup of water or something. So I'll do four times that. So there's a lot of that hydrogen gas in there. And I'll do that every 90 minutes. It has a half life of about 90 minutes in your system. So there's no need to do it every 30 minutes or 60 minutes, but every 90 minutes. I don't Okay. Perfectly. I just, you know, every couple hours, I'm like, oh yeah, I'll do a big old hydrogen drink. And I might even squirt the chlorophyll and the, the oceans alive marine phytoplankton in there. Um, also, um, I'll eat a lot of uh, unsweetened dark cacao without sugar. You know, it does have carbs. That's the thing. So if you're going strict keto, that won't work. Uh, another uh, supplement that I really like is I'll do liposomal glutathione while I'm. Gotcha. Do you uh, have a brand? Uh, Quicksilver Scientific. Oh, okay. Yeah, they make. Uh, I mean, and technically, the thing about it that sucks is it it needs to be refrigerated. It doesn't last too long unrefrigerated. So I'll take it out of the refrigerator, kind of last moment, put it in my backpack, take it on the flight, and then as soon as I get to my hotel, put it back in the fridge. And I, I think I'm doing. Yeah. A, I've talked to the formulator Chris Shave, and he's like, "It's not the end of the world if it's out of refrigeration for a while. You just don't want to get it really hot." But that's another really potent um, anti-inflammatory antioxidant, right? So. Uh, the glutathione. Um, sometimes I'll also do liposomal vitamin C from the same company. Um, let me see, what else do I do? Um, I experiment with on the plane grounding. I'll bring a grounding plug and put it into the ground plug of the plane with a wrist strap. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of brilliant people that will say that's a great idea. A lot of them will say that's a horrible idea. I've not figured it out yet. I know. Yeah, it's difficult. The grounding thing, as you know, is really ambiguous, and there's a lot of brilliant people that have very uh, polarized opinions on whether or not it's good for you and when it is. In other words, if you're in a high EMF environment, electric field environment, then it's said that you become the conduit for the ground, which is not good. So I I don't know. Uh, Another thing you can do is just, of course, keep your bare foot or you know a natural fiber sock on some metal like the metal seat in front of you and effectively you're grounding to the grounded electrical system of the plane yeah people have given me a lot of shit because they're like how are you grounding on a plane you're in the air i'm like i know idiot it's not true grounding you're just you're not free floating um to me the thing that makes sense about grounding on a plane and in a car is it's not so much the electric fields and obviously you're not grounding to the earth itself, but it has to do with the static electricity that's created traveling through time and space, right? Because the air is conductive. The air has humidity in it. So you're traveling through time and space, both in a car and in a plane and creating an immense amount of, um, of static. And that's why those, like the straps I have in my car that you can find on Amazon. I have them on my site actually too. I think it's an Amazon link. It's called an anti-static strap. And when I first learned about those, I learned about them from David Wolf. And I thought, well, that's why would you want to ground your car and yourself um, when you're in an, in an EMF field? But it's not really about that part of the grounding. It's about the static electricity. And when I learned about them, I started seeing them on every bus in LA, like every city bus. And really? they, yeah, and they use them to improve the mileage because it nullifies the static electricity. And the static electricity, for some reason, increases the resistance when you travel in an automobile. And so they actually improve gas mileage. It's really weird. Wow, that's interesting. You know, exactly, I think exactly what you said. I agree with, well, everything you said about grounding, it's very polarized, this entire debate. But there's two parts of grounding the way I see it. There's what comes from the ground to your body and there's what comes from your body to the ground. The static discharge is one thing and it's true. So 
Uh, if you're in a plane, it makes great sense. I've been doing that. I don't know. I haven't quantified it per se, but I, I do use my, my, my foot on, on, on the metal rod there. And, uh, if, if I happen to be alone, that would probably freak out my neighbor a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, I mean, you, you have blue teeth and you have a, a thousand different gizmos. So it's probably not the, <laughs> not the most bizarre thing you do on a plane, right? So there's that. And, and, and there's the antioxidant, uh, negative ions. Uh, not negative ion, but negative charge going from the earth to your body. And that's real grounding. That's like earthing. Uh, so yeah, static discharge, I think it makes great sense. I I mean, I haven't seen any studies on that per se, but uh, I don't think it's going to be studied either. So yeah, better be safe than sorry, I think. Uh, another another thing that is really useful for me while flying, obviously you can't do this driving unless you're the passenger, is I spend most of my flights meditating. And there's a few different ways that I do that because mm-hmm. I want to keep a high HRV and I want to be as parasympathetic as possible because of course that reduces the stress and the fatigue of just all of the travel. Um, oh, while I mention actually another one of my hacks is um, in terms of that the nervous system response to the stress of the whole travel experience, especially air travel, is the minute I arrive at an airport, I put in earplugs and I put on noise canceling headphones right when I get out of the car. And my whole journey until well after I land is spent that way. When you walk into the chaotic energy field of an airport with all of that anxiety and rushing and people being laid and the security checkpoint and just, you know, the, the sort of negative nervous system response you have to someone searching you and your shit and like going through that whole sort of screening process. And for me, it's even more stressful because I'm, I'm always trying to get out of going through the millimeter wave thing. So I want to make sure I'm in the TSA pre-check and global entry. I have all that kind of stuff, which I would highly recommend. Uh, there's, it's kind of two sides. Like it's, you're, you're more tracked, I think, if you have the global entry in the TSA, but it's like, Dude, they know where you are anyway. Like my iPhone is listening to me right now being recorded somewhere and, you know, a server in China that the CIA owns. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, they're just listening to the podcast live. Of being anonymous or over. So I debated, like, I didn't want to do the TSA pre check because then they know who I am. And, you know, I got clear, I got TSA pre check, global entry, whatever. Like, there's no escaping or evading the surveillance state that we already live in anyway. So I just kind of surrendered to it because the benefits of arriving at the airport, having the earplugs in, putting on the noise canceling headphones, uh, making the lines as short as possible. I also, whenever possible, uh, travel business or first class because I, I don't want to wait in line. I don't want a shitty seat. I don't want my back to hurt. I'm more than willing to pay the extra fee to make that flight. Uh, more manageable and less stressful in every way. Even if it means I travel less frequently because yeah. I'm spending four times the money on a ticket or something. And I know this isn't you know an option for everyone, but I think if you really start getting into manifestation practices, anyone can afford to fly however they want. I'm working my way up to the private jet status now. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's the next step. But uh, definitely getting the pre-check and all that stuff. So you whiz through the lines and also don't have to go through the millimeter wave screener, which, hello, you're walking through a 5G antenna and you, you'll tell security, I don't want to go through that. And they're like, what? It's safe. Really? <laughs> Where's your science coming from? Um, so I'll, I'll opt out for a pat down or I'll just, you know, if you have in the US, if you have pre-check um, typically or global entry, they'll send you through just a metal detector, which is much less disruptive. But my point being is I'm going to minimize stress. Like from the time I arrive at the airport till I'm sitting in my seat, I'm going to get the best possible seat. I'll pay for even just a leg room upgrade. I'm 6'2", so it's it's quite stressful and just claustrophobic and confining to sit in like a middle row in the back of the plane. So I'll yeah. spring extra money to be more comfortable. And then back to the meditation... Uh, I don't want to hear any of the announcements. I don't want to talk to the the flight attendants. I don't want to talk to anyone. I want to go inward and I really want to calm my nervous system and I want to get as much restorative rest as possible. So uh, I'll listen to Joe Dispenza meditations, which I'm a huge fan of. Uh, those are, you know, well, they're not free, but they don't require any technology other than noise canceling headphones and your device. Uh, I also am a huge fan of a technology called NuCalm which is a neuroacoustic um, uh, track. Imagine binaural beats on steroids times a million. It's used by 
you know, special ops, military, law enforcement, uh, people that are under excruciating amounts of stress. And New Calm is an amazing system that has the ability to drop you into a parasympathetic state in about 10 to 15 minutes and keep you there for an hour and put you into theta, but keeping you out of delta so you don't fall asleep. But wow. it hums you along in theta. Now it's, you know, it's a couple thousand dollars. It's not cheap technology, but for me, these kind of things are worth investing in because again, like I want to arrive at my destination and just kick ass and have fun and do whatever it is that I'm there to do without having to recover. So whatever meditation technique, sometimes I just do Vedic meditation without any of that stuff and just in silence. Uh, But point being, I'm pretty much meditating the entire flight. Uh, I don't typically do work. I don't typically watch movies. I'll listen to audiobooks, listen to podcasts and meditate the whole time and just rest. So I think of that as like my reprieve between the stress of arriving at an airport and the stress of um, or leaving at an airport and the stress of arriving at your destination airport and getting the Uber and finding the rental car and your luggage and like all that drama. I want to be as resilient as possible. So I want to keep mm. high HRV. I want to be as parasympathetic as possible, be fasted, kind of just stay conscious enough to be not rude to whoever's sitting next to me. If it's it's like, you know, my partner, friend or something like that, obviously, you know, sometimes people want to chat. But other than that, I'm just very much internalized and just going into rest mode and just radiating my own, you know, harmonic field to the people around me and just being super zen and super chill uh, so that then when I land, I'm actually able to respond and deal with all those things that happen when you land, uh, especially for me since I'm pretty smoked. Uh, two other secret weapons in my arsenal on the supplement end uh, are from, well, there's a few actually now. They, the list is growing all the time. But <laughs> one of my favorites is paracetam. Paracetam is oh, okay. like pretty much my favorite standard nootropic. And uh, one of the mechanisms of, of action of paracetam is um, increased oxygen in your brain. So the blood flow in your brain, i.e. the oxygen levels in your brain gets higher when you take paracetam. It's also really useful for adjusting to higher altitude. If you travel from a low altitude location to Mm. a high altitude, paracetam can help you acclimate much faster, as can breath work, obviously. Uh, So I take paracetam pretty much the whole time while I'm flying before, after, during. Uh, If I want to be really alert and awake at the destination. I'll take modafinil during the flight. Okay. Um, modafinil is a pharmaceutical drug invented for narcolepsy, which is a really, it's amazing nootropic for just cognition, mental energy, alertness, memory focus. I take it all the time in small doses, kind of, kind of micro dose it. But I'll take up to a whole tablet, which is 200 milligrams over the duration of a flight, not all at once because it's a bit intense. I'm um, doing it that way for me personally. But I'll do, you know, a half at the beginning of the flight, another half when I'm about to land. And I land and basically feel like Jason Bourne rather than <laughs> someone that's had a lobotomy. That's the difference for me. So yeah. I love modafinil for specific purposes. But you wouldn't want to take modafinil if you want to fall asleep quickly at your destination. You can't gotcha. can sleep on it because it's not an amphetamine, but you just don't want to go to bed because you feel awake, if that makes sense. Yeah. But I, I, it makes sense. And we're, uh, I'm, I'm a beginner with these things. I mean, I never really took any, I, I did try, uh, qualia for a while and it was okay, but I, I had the ca- caffeine version and it was just too stimulating for me. Uh, and I'm, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm not six two, I'm five four. So. It, it it did a lot and I was exhausted at the time. So I think it was just a bad spin of like stimulants for me. So if if I were rested, probably I could have handled it. But in my, my state of mind, it wasn't right. Yeah. But uh, where do you get these things? If you can mention them. <laughs> a paracetam, I have link. It's total. it's legal. And okay. there's a few sites that have it. There's one that's linked on my site. And I, you know, I'm a, okay. this is a commercial. We just happen to be talking about products and I don't I just yeah sure just have affiliates with all these companies so like don't anyone listening don't think I'm trying to slang shit like I really don't care I'm gonna make five cents if you buy the paracetam it's not <laughs> it's not really gonna move the needle for me but again I just put everything on my site because it's like an easy way for me to answer people's questions and a little bit of income does percolate in the background um, you know as I direct people to those links but it's not it's not really my business model but I have the link to the paracetam on my site 
Uh, the modafinil is a little trickier because it's, um, I don't know what its scheduling is in terms of uh, the FDA in the US, but it technically is a prescription drug. So anytime I've had to buy it, you sort of have to use Bitcoin and go into the dark web a bit and buy it from India. It's kind of yeah. buying like erectile dysfunction drugs or something, you know? Yeah. It's just, you got to work your way around the internet a bit. So I don't have a source for modafinil at the moment, but if you poke around online enough, yeah. you can find it. It also has a very... A good track record in terms of safety. Like there's no record of anyone ever overdosing, hurting themselves, becoming dependent on it. I've never heard any negative effects personally. You might find them, but I haven't found any. Um, so modafinil, you have to track around a little bit. Uh, the Prastam is easy to find. It's on my site. Another one that's great is why my tongue is blue. If your video viewers I can see that. Um, I have not been eating candy. That's something called methylene blue. And methylene blue uh, is amazing um, for cognition and brain health. It's a neuroprotective compound. It's um, It comes in a a product. And by the way, don't drink, don't just get methylene blue off Amazon. It's like fish tank cleaner. I use this company called Troscriptions. And it's an amazing nootropic uh, in the form of a trochee, which is a little kind of a lozenge that you put between your cheek and gum. And the Troscriptions product is called Blue Canatine. It has methylene blue, uh, small amounts of nicotine, caffeine, and CBD. And so it's a four-ingredient mm. nootropic. And I find it to be just amazing. I mean, you're supposed to do like a quarter or a half of one, maybe once a day when you want to sit at your computer and get some work done. I pretty much do one like every couple hours <laughs> <laughs> just because I love the feeling it gives me. It's just, it's amazing. The methylene blue, I, I, you know, I'm not that sciencey. I'm a geek, but like once I learn some information, I don't really retain it. I just kind of move on to the next thing. But uh, methylene blue, as I understand it, is a um, electron donor. And so that's kind of the mechanism of action and why it's so great for your brain and your mitochondria is it donates electrons, which the net result of that is giving you energy and specifically energy in your brain. It also protects your neurons in your brain. So that's a really amazing and safe uh, nootropic. And I use that for sure a lot when I'm flying and when I land. Uh, and it's used in uh, medical settings, right? I've heard even discussions. Who was discussing that? Meddling Blue, uh, Ari Withens, uh podcast, The Energy Blueprint. He had a discussion on there about COVID and, and Meddling Blue, like medical applications for virology. Very interesting. Uh, I'm going to link it in the show notes. So it's it also has a, a good track record, right? The safety record. That's funny. I had someone come over and do a blood draw for some lab work that I was doing and she saw my teeth and tongue were all blue. She's like, dude, what is that? <laughs> you wouldn't understand. It's this thing called methylene blue. And she she goes, oh yeah, I remember that. We use it as an antiseptic in nursing school. Yeah. And on wounds, like you would iodine or something like that. And I was like, oh word, I, I didn't know that. So yeah, it's, it's <laughs> an interesting compound. Again, a lot of research behind it, very safe, but um, because it's hard to get the pharmaceutical version of it, which is, of course, the most effective and most safe. Uh, it's one you want to really be careful with, which is why I just, I like the blue canatine from transcriptions because it's verified, guaranteed to be pharmaceutical, you know, the exact dosage. And the only side effect is that it's hard to explain to people why your whole mouth is blue for a couple hours after. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Not eat them when I was going to do a podcast video because I'm like, I don't know, people are going to think I'm weird. And I thought, you know what? People already think you're weird. Who cares? Look at all the shit you do before, during, and after. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Look at the whole laundry list. <laughs> um, oh, another thing I have here on my desk that's amazing for oxidative stress, and this would be something I use when I, you know, after I fly. It's called a Nano V, and mm. you know, again, not not a cheap device, but the Nano V makes something called EZ or Exclusion Zone Water uh, that comes out of the device in a mist that you inhale and it's incredibly powerful uh, for inflammation and oxidative stress. And so I know anytime I take a road trip or a flight, the minute I come home, that's the very first thing I do. Then I do my whole routine with the oxygen chamber, the red light therapy and the ice bath. Uh, getting back to post-flight when you're leaving your home destination, going to your final destination, uh, my recommendation is always the first thing you want to do is get your bare feet on the ground. And I'm like that weirdo that's at baggage claim. 
I, I like the minute I got off the plane, I'm like, where's the sun? First off, I want to get natural light in my eyes, get away from windows, get away from sunglasses, prescription glasses, contacts, get my naked eyes in a natural light environment, get my bare feet on the ground. Uh, if I can, without getting arrested, do some breath work. And this is like while I'm waiting for my bags. And once I get my bags and I get where I'm going, usually I'll have sussed out like a Russian bathhouse where I can go do sauna and ice bath. If I can't find that, if I'm somewhere in a cold climate, I'm going to find um, a natural body of water to get in, a lake, ocean, river. I want to get that inflammation out of my body as quickly as possible. And getting really cold is the very fastest way to do that. A cryotherapy is another way to do that. But what happens when you fly is you just get inflamed, you know, and it just becomes so painful and taxing on your body. So that's like the fastest way to turn down just global inflammation in your body. Um, so I really love to do that as well. Do you, do you have good techniques to uh, do an ice bath in hotels, for example? You're just using the, I don't know, the ice machine or something? Thank you for reminding me of that. In my in the defunct course that I never put out, uh, while I was filming that, I thought, okay, how could I do an ice bath? Go to the liquor store and haul back a bunch of bags of ice. And I said, oh shit, there's an ice machine in every floor of every hotel. So I take my yeah. suitcase that's now empty and I go fill up my suitcase <laughs> with ice and it doesn't hurt your suitcase because it's you know it's it's not melted right so it doesn't even yeah. add or anything you just immediately go back to your room fill up the bath and create an ice bath in there it's a it's an amazing hack and you know for people that are listening they're like even doing a cold shower if you're traveling somewhere that you know has water below 55 degrees fahrenheit you, that that's good too but when you for just cold bath if you're a beginner i guess what was it was the right temperature to 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 get it at if if i don't put ice in there would it be cold enough i mean let's say i'm in uh i'm in montreal in the winter yes because out of the faucet it's like freezing well in terms of cold thermogenesis and getting the positive effects of anti-inflammation uh the experts say that under 55 degrees is the threshold so you can okay. 50 and to some people that's cold to me 50 is like i'm bored i'm like really <laughs> yeah. I, i keep my ice bath at between 35 and 40 Sometimes yeah. it's up to 45 and I'm like, this isn't doing anything. But that's because I've been doing you know, hot and cold therapy, what used to be called hydrotherapy. I've been doing that for 23 years Yeah, in, in every lake, river, ocean, no matter whatever time of year it is. This is way pre-Wim Hof and all of that. I didn't even know about... I didn't even know it was a thing. I just knew it felt good. And I also just put together that from an evolutionary standpoint, human beings um, d didn't figure out you know, how to make a hot water bath until maybe a few thousand years ago by having a big vessel and some fire and you maybe took a hot bath if you were a king or a queen or if you were a native person that, you know, was able to traverse the land and find natural hot springs, you would have had that opportunity. But we've evolved to be in cold ass water and just cold weather in general, those of us that have migrated away from the equator, right? So to me, it's just, it's kind of a natural, um, it's just, it's a very obvious fundamental human health practice to make yourself very hot and very cold as often as possible to build up yeah. your, your resilience and your nervous system. We're just wired that way. Of course, depending on where your, you know, your ancestry is from. I mean, if your people are from the Sahara, then you know, an ice bath to you isn't something that you've evolutionarily been used to, but you can acclimate to it. So for anyone that's afraid of like a cold shower, cold bath, here's how you do it. Well, there's two things. If you do a breathwork practice before, not during while you're in the water, because you could drown, be mindful of that. Uh, drown, not drowned. Um, you could be drowned. <laughs> um, but doing breathwork before that radiates your body with energy and oxygen, and it makes it so much easier to get into the cold water. Now, I don't do that anymore because I'm just lazy about breathwork sometimes. But an easy way to start if you don't want to do breathwork is just do hot and cold showers. So get in the shower. This is how I built up. Get in the shower with it as hot as you like it. You're all cozy, you're all hot. Turn it cold for 20 seconds, then turn it back hot. This is hydrotherapy, which is also really good for you, by the way. It's yeah. just energetically just so refreshing. And then eventually what happened for me is I just stopped turning the water hot ever. I just don't use the hot water. In fact, when I moved into this house, I'm in California, so I'm not as tough as that sounds. Like right now, the cold water is probably like 60 degrees or something. I don't know. It's, it's not very cold. It's pretty warm. Yeah. I moved in here in January and 
I didn't even realize that there was no hot water for the first couple of weeks. It's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> hey, I don't know. I came home and I was tired from a workout or something. I said, oh man, I'm going to take a nice hot bath. And I went to turn on the bath. I thought, man, this bath is broken. And what it was, I just, you know, hadn't turned on the water heater pilot or something like that. Um, so I just, I live by cold showers. But again, back to when you land, finding a natural body of water, getting in sun, taking saunas, taking ice bath, taking a hot shower, a hot and cold shower, like getting in water. Another thing that happens is you build up again, back to that static electricity. So right when you get to your hotel or Airbnb or wherever you're staying, even before you get in water, grab a hairdryer and run the hairdryer all over your naked body to dissipate all that static static electricity. It's really? A, Never I, heard of that. It's amazing. Yeah, it works. And once you notice before and after, you're like, oh my God, I feel so much better. You feel instantly better after flying. It, and- who, who taught you that? Is it just self-experimentation? You know, I think I learned that from Daniel Vitalis. Yeah. Uh, wow. Not, yeah, and he's a he, he's not like Vitalis is like he knows a lot of things. He's like really he, in deep. He's not a techie biohacker kind of guy. No. He's a nature guy and uh yeah. he taught me that. Yeah, and I was like, god, I'll be damned it works. Um so that's you know, that's really the name of the game for me when landing is to get that inflammation down and then get your circadian rhythm yoked to your light environment. And another thing I want to add on that, and I know I'm on kind of a rant here, I'll give you space to ask anything else you want, but sometimes it's easier for me just to dump it all out in one... Sure, no worries. (laughs) Go ahead. (laughs) Forget anything while I'm on a roll. But uh, in terms of managing your light environment... Uh, just like managing your EMF environment, it's really important to manipulate your circadian biology by transforming the color spectrum of light while you're traveling. And this gets a little bit tricky, but if you go back to common sense, it starts to just be fundamentally obvious. So for example, let's say... um, Let's say I'm flying from LA to New York. I'll just use a simple example. So you have a three-hour time difference, right? So um, I'm going to arrive in New York, say, at um, 11 p.m., but it would have gotten dark in New York at 8 p.m. When it's 8 p.m. New York time on that plane, I'm putting on my dark-ass, true dark, blue-blocking glasses. Those are the darkest ones on the market. I I use them. I use blue blocks. I love them all. They're, everyone always asks me, who's the best? I'm like, they're all the best. Get over it. Yeah, they're Great. They all do the same thing. But the true dark wraparound ones, you look like, like a 90s grunge rocker uh, or a Unabomber. It's it's kind of embarrassing. No offense to those guys, but they're, they're not the coolest looking glasses. But I'm going to put those on when it would be you know, dusk going into night at my destination to trick my brain into thinking that the sun just went down, even though it didn't, because I'm still in a blue lit airplane. So just think about that and apply that to whatever time zone you're going into. Now, if you're flying into a time zone where it's going to be dawn, for example, then you wouldn't want to do that because what you're doing is you're, you're shutting down cortisol production and you're putting melatonin production into action. You don't want to do that. You want cortisol when you want to be awake. You want melatonin when you want to be asleep. And they counteract each other. You don't produce both at the same time. You produce one or the other. And when you start producing one, you stop producing the other. And how that happens, literally, it's so fundamentally simple, is by the color spectrum of light that's hitting not only your eyes, but your skin. So you don't want to be wearing like a tank top and no hat on the plane either. And this is where I get psycho on the plane. If I'm flying somewhere and I want to mimic a dark environment, I wear a hoodie, I wear long sleeves. I don't want that blue light in the plane touching me anywhere because I want to get where I'm going and get to sleep as fast as humanly possible. And I don't want to be in a cortisol sympathetic dominant state when I get there. I want to be as relaxed as possible because you know where I'm coming from, it might be still five in the afternoon, but where I've landed now, it's midnight. You see what I mean? So yep. you already have to work hard to trick yourself into that later time zone and just reverse it if you're headed east to west, obviously. Uh, but that the lighting environment is huge because that signals all of that uh, cascade of hormones and neurotransmitters in your body that yoke you to the time zone that you're going to. So using the blue blocking eyewear is critical when it comes to that. So I always have like a bunch of different glasses with me uh, when I travel. Again, it's a lot of work, but it's like, 
I don't know. If you're someone that travels and none of this bothers you, live your best life. Don't do all this shit. <laughs> yeah. Fun. Just for me, as I said earlier, it's just if I don't do this stuff, my trip is just not as successful. And so, um, so there's that. Then the last piece I want to just add is the EMF protective clothing. Now, as I said, you know, depending on what type of plane you're on, how long you're on there for, your EMF exposure is going to vary. But one thing that's for certain is if you're flying from a you know large airport to another large airport, the EMF in the airport is going to be insane and off the charts. All the radar is there, all of the scanning. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's cell towers all over every airport. They're just like right next to the people. Uh, and then, of course, when you land in a city, you know, as Jack Cruz indicated to me, you're dipping out of that 35,000 foot zone where you're kind of above EMF, probably not above radar. I'm not sure. No, probably not, actually. No, of course, you're not above radar. So you're still in that radar field, but you're dropping now down into just all of that cell tower swamp madness in the city you're landing. So I wear LAMS. Um, EMF proof underwear, amazing company out of France. They speak your language. And then um, I also just got uh, this company called No Choice. Uh, they make these silver hoodies. I mean, they're crazy looking, but they're fully EMF proof and you can zip it up over your face. Uh, I also have them on my site. And then I have an EMF proof beanie that I wear on my head to protect my brain when I'm traveling. Is, uh, is that lambs too? Uh, Lambs makes the beanie as well. Yeah. Okay. And then there are some prototypes. There's a guy named Andreas from um, Germany. His company is called, sorry, KTC Labs. KTC Labs. Oh, yeah. You you email me. I'm supposed to uh, try out some pans, but I'm actually too small for like his. Uh, I think he does, does uh, I'm like 29s, right? My my waist. So it's it's very small, but I'll be trying some of his stuff. I I know he's working on sleeping bags too. So uh, it's uh, it has its use and and I I'm, I I must say I, I agree with your assessment of wearing e- e- EMF uh blocking clothing. Uh there's again there's some controversy over it, but especially boxers. You know, I, I talked with uh, uh Professor Hole Jensen. He he's just published uh 650 papers on EMFs uh in, in 50 years of scientific career. Just that. So he knows what he's talking about. And he's like, well, looking at the studies. And looking at the the efficacy of uh, EMF blocking boxers, for example, in his opinion, probably all men should should wear them uh, if if you want to maximize uh, fertility. But if it's not fertility because you don't want to have a kid, surely it might be testosterone, right? I mean, it's right going at function. I mean, that that can be optimized if you remove the chaos of the signal, uh, at, le- at least to that, that area of your body. So I think I think it's a sound uh, recommendation. I want to ask you something. Uh, yeah, so sure. KTC Labs, they make these pants just to finish that, that. I don't think they're in the market yet, but I also wear those. Like if I had my way, I would wear a full EMF proof hat, <laughs> honestly, whenever I drive anywhere or travel. Um, the thing I'm curious about, I want to see if you if you know anything about this is, With the EMF beanie, the thing I'm curious about is because it doesn't cover your face or your neck, are radio waves going through your face and then bouncing around up in your skull on the top of your head because they can't get back out the other side? Do you see what I mean? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think the physics on, on this explanation are right. Uh, from from what I, I could gather in in the last three years, it doesn't work this way. And and actually, because let's say, let's, let's talk about microwave frequencies. They're absorbed uh, very quickly close to your skin to some depending on the source if it's a cell phone it can go through your brain literally but uh if it's if it's uh, overall exposure it would get absorbed by any body of water so the human body is 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 full of water so it it actually becomes absorbed and it's not like it will infiltrate the way the way that that the clothing is blocking i think it's it's pretty much pretty much turns certain surfaces into mirrors for for frequencies um and and I think there's more benefit than harm. That being said, unless you live in a bubble, you're not fully protected. But there's some indications that in, uh, for example, people that are electro hypersensitive, they get specific uh, benefits if they shield the head. However, sometimes they can have exposure to other parts of the body and get a, a head effect. So you can get brain fog from exposure to your 
torso, for example. So it's not linear. So all that being said, shielding, like if we talk about certain doctors like Dr. Uh, Dietrich Klinghart, who treats uh, chronically ill patients, who's really at the top of his field and, and he's aware of the EMF problem, he recommends uh, a minimum of a full T-shirt or uh, it, yeah, full T-shirt covering the torso and either boxers or long long sleeve pants. That's like his assessment is I, I see benefits. He sees benefits for autistic children. He sees benefits for chronically ill people, Parkinson's and people who really are almost by default hypersensitive to everything yeah. basically, right? So yeah. that's all I know for now. But I would if, if it were me, I would... I, and I have boxers, the EMF blocking ba- boxers, but I need to um, to contact Lambs. Actually, I've been slacking on this, but uh, it's a, it's a brand that has that has come very recommended to me, especially because it's three hundred and sixty degree protection and not just a front pouch. I, I didn't like the idea of a front pouch, and I've actually been slacking on a recommendation because of that. The prior yeah. brand did not have this whole protection, and if it's just a front pouch, then the angles. Let's say you have a cell phone and you're sitting on it, like some men do in cars like they put their cell phone right there and their crotch i i think the exposure would still be very high so you want like you want it to 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 close off but it, yeah you, unless you have like a full hazmat suit you cannot really close clo- close up your and then i mean i don't know what the ts is gonna be, t- think about this even if you're pre-checked uh, it's, like, it's gonna freak them out uh, sometimes when i wear andreas's pants which essentially are like a faraday cage they have yeah you know, conductive thread going all through them. Uh, they set off the uh, the metal detector sometimes, <laughs> not all the time, because I'll empty out my pockets and then it goes off. And I thought, what the hell? I have nothing on me. And then they scan me. I'm like, oh shit, it's the EMF pants, you know? Mr. So T- then do you go in a private room with them? Yeah. What happens then? <laughs> to pat you down right there. Okay. <laughs> for clarifying on the beanie, because I've always wondered that. Because when you think about shielding a room, uh, for example, you know, let's say... Let's say, okay, you get, you have a building biologist like a Brian Hoyer come over and yep. take the RF levels in your bedroom, which is, you know, obviously where you want to start shielding. And there's a cell tower coming from, like in my case, actually, I'll just use my case as an example. There's a lot of cell towers coming from the eastern direction, which is where all the windows are right behind the bed. Uh, but they're only coming in from that direction. So I shield that wall with some EMF fabric because there's very few, um, RF signals coming from the other direction. But if I had them coming from all directions and I only shielded one wall, I would essentially be trapping them inside and just bouncing yeah. around like a mirror. Like if you shone a light on a mirror, only going one direction, it had nowhere to escape. It's just going to bounce around that room and you're going to illuminate the whole room basically. Correct. So yeah. because I had my room tested, it's, I mean, I'd prefer to have all the walls shielded, but it's just not practical right now. But that's where I was getting that concept of like, if you're wearing the lambs beanie, are EMFs like coming up underneath you? You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it, in your brain, it, they, they might do that if, if your, if your skull was transparent or non-existent, right? So it's it, the physics. I mean, the beanie in itself, let's say it, it's, it's, it's floating in the air. Maybe like it would get inside but if it's your head it's going to hit like your skin and your tissue yeah so it's going to be absorbed locally i i think and this is what this is what i've i've been hearing but again even brian hoyer you know he told me lately we're collaborating on a on a future uh a course potentially and other things and he's he's still looking into the emf blocking clothing and how we can make it even better so you know it's it's still a, at, at a beginner level R and D with these products simply because the the problem is not um, is not recognized. So there's not a lot of money invested in like okay, what what actually works, right? What materials and combination? And yeah. so at the moment, I think that the boxers are a good idea. I would say even for for women. I mean, if you use your, your cell phone near your 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 near your crotch, like most people do, or near your belly. I would still wear, try to find, to find underwear that's like, well, maybe that's, that's a market. Like, I don't know, like underwear that looks sexy and that blocks CMS. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I have seen some, and again, you're so right that this market is underserved. And for the entrepreneurs listening, if you want to be, oh, yeah, serve and get rich and help people make 
a really cool line of EMF clothing. Like I love lambs, but you know, they're working on their funding and they're kind of dropping. Okay. They did the underwear. They're great. They're super comfortable. They're durable. They're fantastic. They're the testing on the shielding is rock solid. The science is there, the beanie, but they don't have like a hoodie or, you know, then I got to go to the other company, no choice to get the hoodie. So there really is a market share opportunity there um, for someone. But I think um, the, the thing about that, that really comes to mind for me is yeah, Everyone should be wearing the underwear, but for pregnant women, oh yeah, man, you've got to be. They they make these like really high waisted kind of underwear that come up and cover the whole belly and protect the uh, the uh, fetus. Yeah, I forget the site that sells those, but I I have seen them when I'm looking for EMF clothing for myself. Obviously, I wouldn't need that item myself personally, but yeah, I, there's the belly armor. Uh, I'm gonna put it in the show the belly armor belly bend. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, I, we were hesitating, uh, my wife Jen and I, to to get this one. We ended up uh, getting the the blanket, and she was using it whenever she was working in the computer uh, in a cafe, and it's Wi-Fi. It's not like the computer was on her belly, but as it grows. Uh, larger actually, actually the fetus, uh, starts as, as the baby grows and grows, it, it, it starts surfacing and becomes, uh, let's say the, the, the natural protection that, that is normally there becomes thinner and thinner. And, and there's more risk that the exposure levels inside the womb is going to be even higher. And we know, we know even from studies that there's a, a very strong correlation. Two major studies in the last five years or maybe 10 years have shown that uh, uh, basically pregnant women who had a uh, higher RF exposure from their cell phones and other sources were much more likely to give birth to children who had, uh, learning, uh, difficulties and ADD, ADHD. So oh. the, the, the links are, uh, we we do need more science, as everyone likes to to remind us. But at the same time, I mean, this is concerning enough that no mom should be uh, using a device right next to the to the unborn child. Uh, so yeah, that's 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 a great point. But if you're you want to give birth uh, or you want to have a baby or you want to. Uh, fall pregnant, I think it's a good idea to protect yourself. Not not to become paranoiac about like, oh no, I use my cell phone for my child and now he's he's damaged. It's, it's not as simple as that, but uh, to minimize the risks, right? This is this is what 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 this entire thing is all about. It's not uh, living in a bubble, but minimizing the risk and minimizing in your in in your case in this discussion is the 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 downsides of of all having to travel and then just having the plus side of being in London giving a conference. And then coming back feeling like a thousand bucks, and main, and and I mean increasing lo- your longevity in, in the meantime. Because if you feel great, probably you you've you've minimized the damage that you're taking traveling in a completely extraterrestrial way. The way we're doing it, right? It's it's very bizarre and it's 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 marvelous. But at the same time, there's a cost associated with it. So I know that you and people like Dave Asprey who kept pretty much she's traveling all year nonstop. Like you've developed certain techniques to, to really combat that. I, I had a, a, a few things I wanted to mention uh, that I, that I took note of here. I have about uh, five minutes left. So let, let, let's close it out. But uh, the blue blockers, I agree with you a hundred percent. And the first time I was able to go to Asia and uh, one day after I landed, I woke up at the normal like waking time in Asia like that is the the time that I started applying this blue blocker technique. Just that, not nothing really, nothing else. Um, I use my blue blockers whenever it was night in Asia, I was the blue blockers on. And if it was day in Asia and night at my, uh, Montreal, um, uh, departure, well, the blue blockers were off and I was even listening. I don't know, like even like the blue, the, the, the spectrum isn't ideal, but at least it's keeping you producing like cortisol, cortisol, cortisol. And then when it you just look like sunset i don't know tokyo and you're like okay well this is going to be at this timing while i'm flying and you put the blue blockers on made all the difference in the world 24 hours i was i was basically acclimated to the new time and something else i wanted to mention i don't know if you're aware of this but uh dr gaitan chevalier of the earthing institute has told me in an interview 2 years ago that uh there's a circadian rhythm uh, that's a, that's, there's a known circadian rhythm effect 
of earthing. So they, they found out that, and this is why when you ground, right, there's like the sun that, that will tell you what time it is, but also that your connection to the earth, like the, I don't know if it's, I don't know, like the voltage or whatever. There, there are even unknown characteristics electrically when you walk barefoot on the ground in a certain area on the planet that will tell your body you're here. Like you're at this time zone or what geolocation. So it's kind of a, your, your GPS is, is both grounding and, and light at the same time. So I, I, I just thought that that's fascinating. And the question, I'm going to let you comment on those. And also I want to hear about, do you use melatonin prior? Uh, as a preventative measure, because like micro dosing my, melatonin, I've heard like dosage 0.5 milligram. And ha- have you done that? And does it really move the needle for you? That's so funny because as, as you were talking, uh, I was thinking, Luke, you forgot to talk about melatonin. You got to get that. <laughs> And then also, there's one more thing before I forget as well, and that is, uh, in addition to the blue light blocking glasses, you know, and again, I, I acknowledge that I'm a little extreme here, okay? Like, whatever it is, what it is, but that's why I'm on your podcast. Yeah. Also travel with incandescent, uh, warm, amber-colored mm. light bulbs, and whenever I arrive at an Airbnb or a hotel, the first thing I do is change all the light bulbs out. Yeah. And at first it was a little bit of a hassle. Honestly, it's like, oh God, I'm tired, really. And, you know, whoever I'm traveling with is looking at me going, dude, seriously. And after a couple of days, they're like, wow, it's amazing in here. Thank you. Uh, but I change out all the light bulbs. It's not just for the blue light, but hotels specifically are going to have the worst light bulbs. They'll have the CFL bulbs that produce dirty electricity. They produce insane amounts of EMF and shitty light and flicker. And at best, they'll have LED lights that are really gnarly spectrum of non-native blue light and also flicker. So you're walking into just the most toxic light environment. Your light hygiene just gets trashed when you're in a hotel. And blue blocking glasses aren't going to help you with those CFL bulbs on your nightstand next to your head that are blasting you with EMF fields and the flicker. So I take it one step further and I actually just make the lighting beautiful wherever I am. And I have nice little boxes that protect them and they're very light. I mean, they take a bit of space in your suitcase, but they're not heavy. And so I have that, you know, I use those. I For anyone nice. that wants the links, I have um, on my site, lukestory.com slash store. I have the amber incandescent bulbs. That I found them on Amazon. There's a million on there and I found the cheapest, best ones. Again, I'm not going to like get rich from you buying my Amazon links. Yeah. But it'll make it easier for people listening. Um, okay, so back to the melatonin now. Like grounding and earthing, melatonin is one of those where every expert, you know, and I've interviewed most, you know, 400 people now at this point, and everyone's going to tell you some, no, I'm sorry, 300, not 400. Pardon me. Um, on my podcast, The Lifestylist, and I ask many of them uh, about the melatonin piece. My concern with melatonin and the anti-melatonin people are that since it's something that your body manufactures, like glutathione, for example, Mm. that it's unwise to supplement it exogenously because it's going to signal your body to downregulate its own production, like you know, uh, bioidentical hormones like testosterone progesterone, et cetera, would have the same argument. Your body's like, oh, we don't need to do that anymore. It's coming from somewhere else. And that makes sense to me just on a fundamental level. Uh, and then you have other people that talk about you know, exogenous melatonin supplementation as being perfectly safe and actually necessary for longevity because as you get older, you just produce less of it, no matter how much blue light you avoid and what a good boy or girl you are. Like The fact is you just produce less melatonin as you age because the pineal gland just gets older and produces less of it, I presume, you know? So I've heard arguments on both sides. So melatonin use for me, uh, I probably use it just at home. I take this Quicksilver Scientific sleep formula that works really well. It has a bunch of other herbs and it does have a little melatonin, but not much, a couple squirts of that. And it's negligible amount of melatonin. But to your question specifically, when I'm going to travel to a later time zone, which is almost always for me, unless I go to Hawaii, right, from LA, I'm always traveling east or south, but still a later time zone if I go south to Central or South America. Yeah. Um, so uh, what I'll do if I can be 
this organized, which admittedly I'm not always, but the idea at least that I shoot for is to be mindful of when my bedtime would be at my destination, which could be eight o'clock LA time and start dosing melatonin at that time and incrementally over the few days before I leave, go to bed as early as possible, as as close as I can to the time zone uh, at which I'm traveling, to which I'm traveling. Gotcha. And then dose the melatonin then. And everyone tends to agree that that is the best strategy, although it's not always practical because you can't go to bed at 5 p.m. or 8 p.m. or whatever where you are because life's still happening. So it's not always uh, doable, but it makes a lot of sense to me. And even when I've just you know, gone to bed an hour or two earlier, it has helped with the stack of other things I just mentioned to acclimate to that later time zone when I get somewhere. And this- yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I've heard, personally, I've heard 0.5 milligrams of like super tiny doses of melatonin overall because some supplements are like 10, 10 milligrams. I don't know. I don't know what's right. I've done it sometimes three to five days prior at the time where you would Let's say you would be 30 to 60 minutes before sleep at your uh, arrival destination. Sometimes it's impractical because it would be in the middle of your night. So anyway, you try to do your best. When it, If you're traveling to France or Europe, it, w- it would be easy to do. So yeah, why not do it? I think you, you can uh, uh, have this spike of hormone at this time and then your body just have a, an easier time kind of shifting things, I think. It's kind of... E- eases you into the, the the new reality hormonally. I think in terms of the time changes, just really focusing on the temperature of the light that you're exposed to, and also when your eating windows are. I think those are the two things because your gut biome is so influential and just has mm-hmm. to do with your sense of well being and just general health wherever you're going. But focusing really on like okay, being mindful about what's the time at my destination. When do I eat the biggest meal? And what's the temperature of light where I'm going right now? Like if you just nail those two and add in some breath work, some hot and cold therapy of whatever nature, you're pretty much golden. And the rest of this stuff is kind of just icing on a cake. And for people that are nuts like me that just want to take it to the next level or people that are extremely sensitive. But I think just the light, the eating window, grounding, hot and cold, little breath work, like integrate some of that and your traveling experience, whether on ground or air or sea for that matter, will be exponentially better just from applying a few of those basic fundamentals. That's an awesome way to to close this one out, Luke. Uh, let, let us know about your podcast, The Lifestylist Podcast. I mean, it's part of the top podcast in health for a long while. I've been listening to this. Uh, these days I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm too COVID. Like I'm, I'm just cons- consuming a hundred percent COVID information. What can I tell you? I'm going to, I'm going to disconnect from this whole COVID thing after my next article next week. But, uh, let me know about your podcast, your website, what you're working on, how people can reach you. Yeah. So the podcast that you mentioned is called The Life Stylist Podcast. Three words, The Life Stylist. And I interview actually a lot more than people realize, I think, is people in metaphysics and spirituality and personal development. So people like Bruce Lipton and Joe Dispenza and Byron Katie, many meditation teachers, mindfulness teachers, people that are exploring consciousness, uh, whether it be through meditation, breathwork, psychedelics, et cetera. Like that's kind of my main passion. Then the health episodes are really like one out of four will be about some physical practice or device or supplementation and things like that. So it's it's leaning less toward the biohacking just because to me, that's just you know a small piece of the puzzle. It's really about you know mindset and our mental, emotional, and spiritual life. And so the show is more about that. But if I find a niche topic, like having you on the other day and diving into the 5G and EMF thing and talking about COVID-19 and the reaction to it, uh, sometimes I'll I'll dive into those as well. But that's kind of the mothership Mm. of my content. And I live stream all those like I'm live streaming on Facebook and Instagram right now. Uh, And so there'll be a YouTube video and and an audio podcast for every episode. They come out every Tuesday and sometimes also on Fridays as yours did today on my show. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and as far as on social, my most active, I would say, is uh, Instagram. I'm at Luke Story with an E-Y, S-T-O-R-E-Y. And my mothership website where my store that I've mentioned a few times exists, again, I don't make anything. I just have links and discount codes and things on there, uh, is LukeStory.com. That's S-T-O-R-E-Y, LukeStory.com. And from there, 
you can link out to all of the content. I'm I'm like a content machine. I'm just you are, yeah. <laughs> every day is just document anything cool and interesting that I do that'll help people live their best life, you know. And so it's my passion, my pleasure. It's just it's what I would do anyway if it wasn't my career. I'm just so fortunate that I finally, you know, took the plunge four years ago and made it my career after spending 17 years working in the Hollywood and the entertainment industry and fashion industry and. Now that's what I do. And, you know, you can find me at all of those places. And I'm, I'm so just grateful and passionate about the life that I'm building and sharing with so many people. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for sharing your, your, your wisdom, Luke. And I, I have to just mention your, your podcast. It's like, get ready for, for like the deep dive. And this is what I love. Like I love, there's two podcasts that I love, yours and Paul Check. <laughs> Paul Check, because both have like these three hour long ass interviews that finally dive deep into a topic to the point where I'm like, I'm satisfied. I don't know. That's me. So it, it's like to the point that I'm like, oh, I'm stuffed. I'm going to, I'm going to leave for a while. And because you, you, you strike on all angles and, and I love also the, the spiritual episode and you're, you're someone, I mean, we talk about we we've been geeking out about like i guess biohacking but this is not your 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 main thing and you're you're highly uh evolved and a spiritual guy that uh i i really uh, aspire to become to uh, later in my life so there's also this whole aspect to you that uh i think people need to discover as well so uh please follow luke he's he's really a, a the go to guy to to look at in in health and a very genuine person Thank you, sir. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me on. It's a nice, uh, nice flipping of the microphones today. And I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, uh, getting some feedback on the show that you dropped. I just posted it a couple hours ago to my, my feed. And so I'm excited to, you know, share your wisdom with people too. The episode we did was really, really cool and much different than the other covid centric episodes i've done which have been a bit more oh fringe and conspiratorial i would say yeah yours was the most not my style <laughs> yeah i know so i you know it was nice today to drop that like okay everyone can relax like here's a way to look at it because you know i'm i mean i'm yeah. in the middle of i'm booking david ike and i mean i'm getting some people that are like you know have very different points of view on it so yeah Thank you for coming on and kind of balancing out the... the sure, my pleasure. But yeah. Thanks thanks for coming on the show. And uh, I hope we do a part two about uh, another subtopic that you'll be surprised about. And then you'll drop 90 minutes of knowledge about out of nowhere. Love it. Anytime, dude. Thank you.